participants, welcome to the fifth module of the fifth week. We have seen the development of the post-colonial theory, gone through the major arguments and have also tried to review very briefly the three main theorists. In the current module, we would discuss two literary texts in order to find out to what extent the post-colonial representation has been achieved in these two texts. The idea of post-colonial theory as we have seen has emerged from the inability of the European theory to deal adequately with the complexities and varied cultural pro provenness of post-colonial writing. To take up literary texts as case studies is also an established educational and eth ethnographical tool because they provide us knowledge of the specific culture, the specific geography the specific traditions of that particular zone and at the same time we would find that they also present the accumulating complexity of discussions around a number of central themes. Under the post-colonial theory as we have discussed earlier also authors from around the globe are clubbed together not only on the basis of their languages perhaps not only because they are writing in a particular language which they had shared with their colonial masters, but because of the fact that they belonged to countries which had been once colonized. All these people and writers have all over their scaffolding of literary competence possess an additional layer of colonial culture which has shaped the thematic and formal preoccupations of these writers. I have put the word here the British colonial culture as the texts which I am going to discuss in this module are produced by those two authors who belong to erstwhile British colonies. We may see that in these texts the colonial inheritance operates in very specific contexts. Indigenous theories have been developed to accommodate differences within various cultural traditions as well as the desire to describe the features shared across these traditions and issues like race, cultural identity, nationalism, mimicry, unhomeliness, migration etc. are being continually defined and redefined in the post-colonial context by various authors. Today I am going to discuss the two trilogies which have been produced in the post-colonial context and have left a major impact on literary critical theories. The first one is an African trilogy by Chinu Ayachibi. The other is an Indian trilogy written by Amitav Ghosh. Achibi as well as Ghosh have tried to retrieve the history of the colonized people by telling a particular story. In order to retrieve the history, they have gone back to the roots of different situations to find out what were the reasons which compelled the people to surrender to the colonial masters. And by retrieving the history, they also want to regain their identity. They make the autobiographical novel a popular subgenre among the African writers because Chinua H.B. had particularly narrated the history of his own family in a way. These two trilogies by H.B. as well as by Ghosh quietly offer a particular world to the reader without any interruption. They are confident the readers will understand the values of their text even if they do not sympathize with the world picture which has been presented by them. And therefore, these trilogies right from the beginning neither idealize or exoticize or undermine the values of specific cultures be it African or American. They just try to truthfully present a particular section of reality, a slice of reality before the audience in the hope that they would be able to understand the values and the histories which these writers are attempting to produce. These two trilogies have been written in English and therefore these two writers have also had to face certain criticism because when they started to write in English it was considered that this was the, the language of the colonial masters and therefore the intentions and the vericity was also questioned. It was also said that they are trying to target the western audience only 
by writing in the medium of English language and also by choosing a narrative structure which is a product of the waste. However, we find that both H-E-B and Ghosh have used African words and Indian words in order to represent truthfully the understanding of the local truths and maybe we can understand this attempt to incorporate the local audience also. Sometimes it is said that by incorporating the words of the other languages in English. For example, Achebe has used the African words and Ghosh has used the Indian or let us say the Bengali words. So, in a way we find that these two writers are also struggling for the universal acceptance of their own language. So, that the speakers of these languages do not have a sense of shame in the use of these languages in the international scenario. And also in order to suggest before the international audience that their languages also have the power and the capacity and the nuances to present their arguments before an international audience. They have also presented a very detailed discussion of local practices and ways. Gino HB's African trilogy, Things Fall Apart, published in 1958, no longer at ease following after two years and Arrow of God published in 1964 have often also been criticized on the basis of these arguments which we have already seen, the use of the language and the use of the structure of the novel. The first part of the trilogy, Things Fall Apart, has introduced the basic thematic concerns of the trilogy. HB has described the conflict between pre-colonial African tradition and post-colonial Western modernity and influences. Based on the story of Umofia, a group of nine related villages just before the arrival of the whites, Achebe has tried to weave a story in which these three novels come together to trace the changes which have been brought about by the European imperialism and colonialism in the Nigerian society. HB has focused on the presentation of the Igbo society, their native oral traditions, folk tales, proverbs, their gods and goddesses and their issues. The novel combines the rhythms of the Igbo speech and oral tradition with the conventions of the European novel to create a complex post-colonial text. The trilogy mediates on the fabric of African society and culture and also it responds to the influx of European modernity, value systems, etc. These three novels trace the changes through the life and experiences of a central hero. Uh, the hero happens to be a male figure who also happens to be a tragic figure, a person who is caught up in the events which are often beyond their own control. And therefore, we have Okunku in Things Fall Apart, Obi the grandson of Okonko in colonial Nigeria in the second part of the trilogy no longer at ease and Izilu, a priest of the Ulu village in Arrow of God. Things Fall Apart is the most critically acclaimed and the most widely read novel by Achebe. And as all of us know very well, the title of the novel has been taken up from a very famous poem of W.B. Yeats, The Second Comer. Things Fall Apart, the center cannot hold. It is an archetypal form of modern African novel in English, which has also influenced the traditions of African novel, whereas in turn it has also adopted the tradition of the European novel. It was very well received in the European market, but it also elicited responses in Nigeria, which were initially skeptic or mixed, but gradually it went on to become a very important text in African literature and also in the post-colonial literature the world over. In fact, if we look at the review of Nigerian novel Laureate Wole Soinka, we find that Soinka has termed this novel as the first in English which is spoke from the interior of the African character rather than portraying the African as an exotic as the white man would see him. Divided into three parts, we find that the novel is centered around the life and experiences of Okonko, the tragic hero, who ultimately paves the way for his own destruction as a result of his hubris and his inability to adopt 
to adopt the changes which have been brought about by the colonial expansion in the traditional Igbo society. The novel has presented a vivid and complex picture of the southeast part of Nigeria. The society is the Igbo society which he has described. However, we find that Achebe has fought against every impulse to present a romantic picture or an idyllic picture of the pre-colonial Nigerian society. He has given a very mat matter of fact detail of the pre-colonial life of the villagers with its own complexities, with its own biases and preferences over different issues. And therefore, the attempts to read this novel from any other perspective except the post-colonial one has ultimately resulted into a fierce criticism of this novel as we would see later on. The novel also makes it clear that the Igbo society is not an ideal society. It has its own issues and complexes. It has ostracization of the non-conformists, the plights of those people who have been dedicated to gods and therefore they are the outcasts. They have their own superstitions, their own rigid social hierarchies. They also have very ugly treatment as far as the women are concerned. We find that Okonko's rise and fall over the course of the novel dramatizes these thematic concerns and puts them into a particular perspective. Okonko has always tried to overcome the legacy or the past which has been left for his fate by his father Unoka who was normally known for those traits which were not masculine enough for any traditional Igbo society. Unoka had been dead for 10 years when the novel begins and Okonko throughout his novel as depicted by Achebe has been driven by a desire to reject everything that resembled his father who had a low status in the Igbo society and had amassed debts. So, Unoka was a musician who preferred revelry over display of masculine strength who believed in living life to its fullest but for Okonko we find that these were the feminine traits and he preferred to gain reputation as a wrestler by defeating other legendary wrestlers. Success for Okonko is based on personal achievements, efforts and hard work and that is why we find that his hegemonic and toxic masculinity does not allow him to look at his own son in a friendly manner. Okonko's downfall can be traced to the fear of losing his identity based on a hegemonic notion of masculinity. And as we have seen earlier, he does not like his own eldest son, Dioe, who appears to him to exhibit signs of weakness and he therefore makes life deliberately difficult for him in the belief that these difficulties and tests would make him strong. Downfall begins with Okonko's participation in the killing of Ikemefuna even though people had warned him against it. Ikemefuna was a hostage child from another village who had been in the custody of Okonko and who had always regarded, regarded him as a surrogate father. His separation is further compounded when he accidentally kills the son of the man who had warned him not to participate in the killing of Ikemefuna. He is exiled from his village for seven years as a punishment for the killing of a boy which is seen as a crime against the earth goddess. So, we find that Okonko's exile to his village also introduces us to another major change in the Nigerian society which was happening simultaneously and that was the arrival of the white men and the reports of their atrocities. The proselytizing mission of the missionaries who were ultimately able to convert the outcast and those who did not enjoy title or status in traditional Igbo society started clashes with the patriarchal society of the Igbo people and Okonko led the distaste of the traditional Nigerian societies towards the colonial powers. Okonko's own son Nyoe, whom he had always disliked converts to Christianity because to him it offers a way to get back at his father and respond to his own needs to reject the reactionary masculinity which in his mind has been embodied by his father. 
So, the new religion gains more follower and Okonku resents his mother's clan for being weak and effeminate because they fail to curb the spread of these new forces. The new religion indeed destroys the old customs and thereby the traditional fabric of the pre-colonial society. And in the novel, we find that Achebe has described how the spread of the religion coincided with the spread of the colonial empire, empire and also gradually we would find as we would see in Ghosh's trilogy, the spread of the religion coincides with the spread of the colonial empire and it, these two also coincide with the spread of the capitalist economic forces. So, when the clash with the white men comes to a heat, we find that Okonko sees that war is only a viable option and therefore, he murders the governor's messenger. However, in doing so, we find that the tra his tragedy is completed as he symbolizes that the arrival of the white men would drastically change the old ways and fabric of Nigerian society. So, we find that Achebe presents the story of the transition from pre-colonial Nigeria to colonial Nigeria from the lens of the life and death of a tragic figure like Okonko, who represent the old belief systems which cannot survive under colonial empire. Comparisons with Neil Ratan Halder, a major character in the Ibis trilogy by Amitav Ghosh would not be inappropriate at this point. Amitav Ghosh's Ibis trilogy is a historical fiction. It is not autobiographical as was Achebe's trilogy. However, we find that it has very meticulously recorded historical details of India under the colonial rule. It comprises of sea of poppies, river of smoke and flood of fire. The time period which it has covered is the first half of the 19th century and it mainly deals with the events surrounding East India Company's opium trade between India and China. At the same time, this trilogy has taken up the issues of trafficking of coolies, indentured labors to sugar plantations in Mauritius and events that lead up to the first opium war. The trilogy is named after the ship Ibis on which the majority of the characters meet each other for the first time. Ibis is transporting indentured laborers and convicts from Calcutta to Mauritius and these laborers and convicts also include Neil Ratan and Diti the two major characters of the trilogy. The ship gets stuck in a storm along with two other ships Anahita and Dread Ruth and some passengers make it to Mauritius, others find themselves in, Con in Canton and Hong Kong and these characters are caught up in the events leading up to the first opium war. The first novel of the trilogy Sea of Poppies is set prior to the first opium war. The main characters are Diti an ordinary and pious village woman who becomes a victim of her circumstances and in order to escape force sati victimization, she decides to join the ship in order to escape the Indian society. Another major, major character is Jachari Reed, an American sailor who is born to a quadroon or an interracial mother and a white father. And he is a person who is trying to escape the racism of his own country. However, he finds better situation uh, when he comes to India. Neil Ratan Halder is a Raja or a Jamidar who has incurred significant debt because of the investment in the opium trade. And in order to escape his debts, we find that the company ultimately manipulates to entrap him into certain forgeries and then he is sent to jail and as a convict he is being sent over this ship. Another passenger is Benjamin Burnham who owns this ship and who is an evangelist opium trader. By the later half of the novel we find that these characters and several others find themselves on board Ibis which is distant to Mauritius. In the Sea of Poppies, Ghosh has depicted the plight of those peasants who are doubly exploited. For compulsive farming of poppies, the peasants have to go bankrupt monetarily and then it leads them to choose indentureship in faraway islands to escape the debts. 
Ghosh shows how colonialism facilitates the inroads of capitalism into Indian society and it is one of the most poignant critiques of colonialism produced so far by Ghosh. It is more extensive than another novel by Ghosh also, The Glass Palace. River of Smoke follows the lives of characters who survive the storm and mutiny that befall Saibis in the previous novel and this novel follows the lives and traditions of Indian migrants in Mauritius. Lives and traditions because most of the Indian migrants carry the load of the traditions also from India. The plot of the novel is set in Frankwee town and major characters in corpor are Barham Modi, his lover, uh, a Cantonese Tanka woman and his son and at the same time we find that some of the characters from the previous novel are also there including Neil Ratan Haldar, Paulit etc. We find that commodification of labor and the intrusion of capitalism into Indian society has been a major feature of the river of smoke which is the second novel of the trilogy. Ghosh has drawn a very detailed picture of how opium enslaves the entire social system of India. He tries to draw different facets of the history of opium trade and the opium wars. Through the portrayal of subaltern characters, he compels the readers to see many things which are not mentioned in the documented history of opium trade and opium wars. The labor force whether they are the farmers or the workers in the opium factories are monetarily dependent on opium and in their laser hours they use it as a drug. Consequently, it tears apart the social fabric as represented by Diti's character in this trilogy. Flood of Fire is the final novel of this Ibis trilogy and it deals with events between 1839 and 1841 where the first opium war has actually started. It also traces the trajectories of characters who find themselves caught up in the war. Flood of Fire describes among other aspects of uh, post-colonial experience the presence of a schism in the Indian people's psyche irrespective of their social and economic position during the colonial regime. Ghosh describes very clearly how it is not only the subaltern but also the elite Indians who find themselves in a situation of being participants in the colonizing process and this realization has permanently planted a dilemma in their mind. Through the portrayals of various characters, particularly the characters of Neil Ratan Haldar, the Zamidar and Kesari Singh in the flood of fire, Ghosh has given a very detailed nature of the dilemma of colonized Indians who belong to different socio-economic strata. These characters, Neil Ratan and Kesari, come from different social and economic spheres of society, but neither of them is able to avoid the schismatic effect of the colonial empire. Like Achebe's questioning, Amitav Ghosh's critique has also been related with his credibility of registering the agency of the subaltern partially because of his socio-economic standing and also because he was writing in the medium of English. But Ghosh's novels have shown us that one does not have to portray only the marginal characters in order to depict their marginality within post-colonial practices. Ghosh does not confine himself in depicting the details of the socio-economically less privileged people, but at times he has also given us the details of the lives of well-to-do people, influential people and especially the social transactions between people of different nations and social fabric. The marginality or the stakes of the marginal becomes manifest in his texts through these transactions. So, we find that these two texts have very effectively portrayed the post-colonial reality through various thematic representations and through the delineation of various characters in African and in Indian context. These two writers are two significant writers who have in their writings internalized the quintessence of the post-colonial theory and have presented it very beautifully and succinctly. Thank you.